is December 29th, 2022. This is Rook. Well, hi there. Welcome to episode 227 of Rook. Dear Western journalists, your colleagues are behind bars in Iran. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durur Bashama. Dear Western journalists, your colleagues are being tortured in Iran. Count this amongst all the sad, hideous, and deplorable distinctions earned by this Islamic Republic, world's worst jailer of journalists. That's right. According to the newly released annual prison report by the Committee to Protect Journalists, Iran now ranks number one, ahead of such media-friendly utopias like China, Myanmar, Turkey, and Belarus, the manifestation of a theocracy under the gun. Dear Western journalists, your colleagues are behind bars in Iran. In the Iranian regime's brutal crackdown to try to stop the ongoing revolution, reporters and editors have certainly not been spared. And what kind of a message does it send when you're arresting another journalist every day? Is it perhaps that you're terrified and hoping to keep a tight lid on what honest media might have to say? Dozens of journalists have been detained since Maso Amini was killed in September, including brave women who reported on her death. Both female and male journalists have been arrested and likely subjected to solitary confinement and psychological and physical torture. Say their names, Dilufar Hamedi, Elohim Mohammadi. And upon saying their names, here's one more mention. If you're out there somewhere working in Western media, we could use your attention. And don't even just do this for the sake of human rights, freedom, and democracy. Do it because your media brothers and sisters are being attacked in this dying autocracy. As bad as the climate has been for journalists in Iran in the past, there is nothing to compare to the way the latest crackdown has been cast. Any reporter simply trying to do their job is now at risk. Their only crime being their occupation, being arrested, summoned, threatened, and told to comply or face retaliation. Let's spell this out. If you're caught reporting or writing something that the regime does not like, you're up for prosecution. You may have your home raided, your family warned. It may end up in execution. And of course, this is in contravention to the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19. Let's spell that out, too. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media regardless of frontiers. Wouldn't you know that Iran has been a signatory to that declaration for years? The world's worst jailer of journalists. Iran is finally number one. Dear Western media, isn't it time to see this terrorist regime undone? Coming up on this edition of Rook, award-winning journalist and physician Gilda Sahebi, journalist Maso Mortazavi, and popular artist Ebrin Bakari in our studio. This is Rook, episode 227. Dear Western journalists, your colleagues are behind bars in Iran. Here we are in the Rook studio for another new edition of Rook. It's almost a new year, and uh, I guess we're a few days away from that. It's a, it's quite a show that we have for you in the meantime, though. Our final show of 2022. Coming up, Gilda Sahebi. Gilda Sahebi. Um, do, you, do you know who this person is? I do. Well, I mean, did you know of her <laughs> before we booked her on? on no, to be fair, I did because not. Because she's fantastic. She's... Uh, She's uh, in Germany, and she is a, an Iranian German uh, journalist. Actually, funny enough, she's a she's a perfect Persian overachiever in that she's a a prominent and prolific journalist, but also a doctor. <laughs> Can't forget that part. <laughs> because because if you weren't feeling enough shame that you haven't achieved enough in your life, um, Gilda, I really wanted her on the show because. So much of what we do here and the perspective that we have is from it's it is from the diaspora, but it's from the North Amer- North American perspective. Uh, and uh, so much of what's going on in terms of the support, uh, the interaction uh, with Iran, 
uh, and the support in the diaspora is emanating out of the EU, mm-hmm. and in particularly Germany that we've talked so much about in recent right. shows. Um, so to, to speak to somebody on the ground there who does that work in Germany and who can tell us, for example, is Germany really mm-hmm. taking the lead in a progressive way in, in terms of creating uh, change or you know, uh, uh, putting the, holding the regime's uh, feet to the fire, um, we know we have our own perspectives in Canada about the Canadian government, and yet from the outside, people will say, oh, Canada, you guys are mm-hmm. leading the way. It's so progressive. So, you know, for I saw the prime minister with the uh, hominis smiling or something. And so it's not always the truth when you know, you know, I mean, you have a different perspective inside the country. So Gilda will give us the perspective from Germany. Um, this past week as well, the German media magazine, Medium, awarded her the distinction of journalist of the year in the field of politics in Germany. So uh, it'll be good to have her coming on the show, coming up uh, from Germany, and also coming up in the Rook studio, Ebrin Bakeri. You know Ebrin, I'm sure? Of course. Uh, yeah. The uh, the fabulous uh, artist. Yes, uh, yes I Now, we had him on before because he does these incredibly inventive uh, ver- self-portraits mm-hmm. that have become his style. But recently, and he's a... Amongst his fans is uh, Queen Fada, who mm-hmm. he has done a portrait of as well. But most recently, in the last few months, all of his work has been focused on um, portraying, drawing the victims of the regime during this uh, uprising in Iran. So Ebrin, Ebrin Bakari, joining us here in the Rook studio, coming up for our Rook Roundtable. Let's do that first, as ever. Hello, Pega, officially. Hello. Hello, Shia. Hi, Azza. And another special guest here for our Rook Roundtable, a returning champion, actually. She's a reporter, host, and documentary filmmaker. She's been a journalist for uh, many years. After moving to Canada, Mahsa Mortazavi has been focusing on Iran issues as the Canadian correspondent with Iran International TV. She's been very actively broadcasting on the revolution and the Iranian community here in the diaspora in the last four months. And she joins us here in the Rook studio for our Rook Roundtable. Hello. Hi. Nice to have you back. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Lots to get to. I I would be remiss if um, I want to kick off the Rook Roundtable talking about something that is not specifically Iranian. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is the news just broke a couple of hours ago of the um, sad passing of Pele, the soccer icon. Mm -hmm. Um, Not even soccer icon, cultural icon. Rest in peace, Pele. And I suspect if it weren't for the revolution happening right now, which of course we're appreciative of, but uh, has completely changed our programming. Mm -hmm. I suspect we would be planning a full show uh, on Pele, because like Maradona, which we did a full show on when he died, there are a lot of Iranian Mm -hmm. fans of Pele. You can't separate a a, a football icon from Iranians. Um, One of the icons of the 20th century, Probably the finest exponent of the beautiful game. You know, he kind of put uh, put put the beautiful game into action with his incredible abilities. His his real name is Edson. Uh, do you know who he was named after? I don't. Anybody? So Edson. Edson. Uh, his father? Mm, I don't know. Mm, that good, excellent, good work, Becca. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, he was named after Only Thomas Edison. Oh, oh, really? Yes. Interesting. Because electricity had just come to Brazil right before Pele was born. Oh, wow, interesting. So he was named after Thomas Edison. He came from poverty. He he didn't even, when he began playing football, his father taught him, he didn't even have a ball. He was kicking a, a rolled up socks uh, wow. that he was used, used as, as a ball. So, so that's why he was kind of a, not just a cultural and sporting legend, but um, a role model for people around the world of different classes because mm-hmm. here's a guy who came mm-hmm. from nothing and became um, the biggest deal in the world. I, I remember when I was a little kid, uh, I didn't really know, um, you know, I was growing up in England and then we came to Canada um, and the, the sort of my era is Maradona. You know, he became the, by the time I'm a teenager, I know who Maradona mm-hmm. is. And mm-hmm. I, but the only name I really knew before that in uh, other than Bobby Charlton, because I had a I had a Bobby Charlton little um, <laughs> football game thing that I had in England, but other than that was Pele. Yeah. It was just the name you knew. It was mm-hmm. kind of like 
uh, one one name uh, like Cher or Madonna. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. we, we just know, uh, or Ebby for that matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Google Cher. Why am I using non-Iranian at references? Pele. Uh, was that? Did you know? You must have known of Pele oh, yeah. growing up in Iran. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you are a good player at football. Everyone call you Pele. Oh, Pele, come here! You know, <laughs> I, I don't remember. Like I, I remember some of his scores, but I don't remember his way of playing. Oh, yeah. well, fortunately, the internet exists. Yes. You can go and <laughs> yes. see some footage of it. Yeah. He retired. I mean, he, he he left the game pretty early, and and you know. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 international game. He ended up coming to the New York Cosmos and and playing in his later years in the in the major league soccer in the North American uh, league. But but something interesting about Pele. Do you know that he was excommunicated for for a while from the Brazilian soccer team, the national soccer team, right around after the I think it was after the 1970 World Cup. Don't quote me on this. I might be wrong. It might have been right before that. The one that Brazil won. Mm-hmm. Um, because he was considered a political dissident because if he had sort of left-wing views wow. so um can we think of any parallel of a great footballer <laughs> being cast out by his country uh by the uh, regime in the country um so yes um rest in peace pele and uh and um, everything I've ever heard about, never had the chance to meet him or interview him, but everything you ever heard about him was that he was just a, such a gracious, incredible soul. Mm-hmm. He did have a very long name, did he? Yes, yes his full Edson name. Armango Aragonda. You know what I remember from him? The Fair only the thing, sure. yeah, exactly. That's the only <laughs> that, thing the I what, remember. The name? What? Yeah, so there was this show um, that Manu Chernozari would um, host. Yeah. And um, in Ferdos- Iran? yeah, okay. in Iran, and the, um, Ferdosipur was, was one of the people who participated in in that contest, and he asked for the complete name of Pele or <laughs> the first name of Pele, and he he gave the full name, and everybody was shocked. Yeah. <laughs> so, for the non-footballist person that I am, that's the only memory I have from Pele. Edson Arantes do <laughs> Nascimento. There yes. you go. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mm. More simply known as Pele. Rest in peace. With good reason, more simply known as Pele. <laughs> Let, let's yes. get to our, our Rook Roundtable. I, I thought, especially with you here, Massa, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't start with, I mean, we'll go through a couple of things that have come up in the last couple of days before we get to our first guest, uh, uh, Gilda, in Germany, because I think um, she's got a lot to add to, to what we've been seeing in the news recently as well. But I thought we'd be, we'd be remiss if we don't talk about the news around PS Flight 752, or flight PS752. Um, this is something that, again, if you're in the Iranian diaspora, or maybe listening to us in Iran, you've been aware of what happened in the last 24 hours because there was a lot of social media announcement about this. But that something that the families of, of the victims of flight 752, um, that horrific uh, fl- plane that was uh, shot down almost exactly three years ago by mm-hmm. the regime um, and casualties in in three countries in the world a lot of canadian iranian canadians the families of those victims have long been advocating for some kind of international um um, court of justice court of justice so they're addressing this on an international level uh and a criminal level and taking the regime to task finally uh after some time there has been some movement on this um, so, Pega, you start off with give 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 us exactly the the quick version of mm-hmm. in case anyone isn't caught up uh, of what has happened. Yeah. So, like you mentioned, there's four countries at the forefront of this, and they are Canada, Ukraine, Sweden, and the UK. And so, basically, uh, what was just recently announced is that these four countries can now take their case to ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, where they can, you know, look for reper- some sort of reparation for what's what's occurred. Now, the the reason why this is a big deal is that. Um, they're likely not going to have any sort of um, real communication with the Islamic Republic because the Islamic Republic is known to be, you know, not very, um, they don't, they don't conform. They don't responsive. They don't, yeah. yeah, responsive, I guess we could say. But what's important about that and the reason why it's important and expected that that's going to happen is that if they are not responsive, then what will actually happen is that this will go to the next step. And the next step would be for the referral of this matter to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Right. And so that's why this has come as a celebration 
um, for the organizations that have been kind of behind um, pushing this agenda forward. And by the way, it's impossible to untangle this from the ongoing revolution in Iran. It's not it's not directly correlated, mm-hmm. but er, a, anything that has to do with this regime, atrocities, injustice, et cetera, is all sort of in the same box right now. Massa, it was fortuitous to have you coming in because I can't I can think of very few people I mean, maybe our friend Babak Payomi, who made the, the documentary about 752 and Hamid. Uh, but uh, there are a few people who've spent as much time as you have, partly as a byproduct of being uh, the Canadian correspondent for an Iranian network. Um, so many of the victims and, and the people who've been speaking out about this are in Toronto or in Canada. You've you know been there three years now um, uh, uh, talking to them. Uh, so give us your perspective on the significance of yesterday. I think yesterday was one of the few days that um, the families of the victims were actually having happy moments because this was one of the things that they have been wanting from the beginning and this seemed impossible because Iran is not a part of any kind of international court of justice. Um, It doesn't have any agreement. It's not following any rule of law. Uh, It hasn't been helpful since the day one. They have been lying and lying over and over uh, about how this happened. If you remember, for three days, they were only denying that this happened, and it was shot down by missiles um, by the government of Iran. And so far, it's been a bumpy road for the families. They have been trying so hard to find ways to make this something legal that Mm. countries can look into instead of going after people on their own because that would have been impossible for the people who are seeking justice. This should be taken care of through uh, an international court of law. And um, yesterday it was made possible. I don't know if you want me to explain how it was made possible. Uh, If you can do it extremely briefly. Yeah, Yeah, okay. So there was this um, article in an uh, aviation-related, Okay, I'm forgetting the name in English. Chicago Mohed. Convention. Convention, on the, yes. Yeah. So that, um, it wasn't actually Chicago, it was Montreal, 1971. So this convention has um, an article in it c- called Article 14 that wasn't signed by previous right. um, Soviet Union. And now it's signed by Ukraine. And now all the four countries who are actually trying to solve this matter, they are on the same page. And this has made it possible for this case to go to the Court of Justice in Hague. Okay. So um, it's been a big step. And I'm sure that there are more big steps to come because this is only the beginning of it. My, and so let me ask a question that I, I suspect some people might be... Th- might have in their mind, but uh, it's important that I issue this disclaimer that I'm asking this question without any cynicism. It's I really just genuinely want to ask this question and without any disrespect for those who've worked so hard to get it to this point, kick the ball to this point. Uh, does w- Would this actually make a difference? Yes. Um, so how will this make a difference? Because the knee-jerk response um, is this regime in Iran doesn't listen to, doesn't give a shit about anybody right. and and any certainly any jurisdiction or international law as you say they're not even signed up to it so so how will this make a difference um for any kind of tragedy that happens um people need closure they need to find out the truth they need to find out why this happened to their loved ones and this is a big step towards it because there is an international court that will look into it and hold people accountable for what happened. You can't just get away with something that happened mm. to your family. You can't. It's it's impossible to put a closure to something that is open for eternity, right? So Court of Justice um, in Hague is the right place to look into this matter. Although the people in Iran who are going to be held accountable for this, they might not even exit Iran, never might not be arrested. Yeah. But there will be uh, convictions. Um, it will be looked into as a criminal activity and that it was something that was done on purpose, yes. something that hasn't been, um, hasn't been, um, how do you say it? Uh, so for, for so far from three years ago until now, no one has confirmed that this was done on purpose, but taking it to the court of law in Hague 
right. will no official body or institution yeah. has done so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well said. I, it, you know, the first guest we ever had, first edition of Rook, was Hamid Ismailian. Mm -hmm. It was almost three years ago. It was about a, a month or two after the um, this horrific. Uh, uh, plane was shot down at this, this event and he speaks in that interview about wanting um, justice wanting to hold these people accountable and you, you know to think about that moment three years ago almost three years ago and how far uh, he and others have pushed this to get it to this point is is really um, something special in other words not letting it go and this is to all of the the, the families who've just been uh, you know, relentless in not letting not letting us drop the ball on this, uh, and us being the global community. Um, kudos to them. You also said you thought this was important, Peggy. Go yeah, ahead. absolutely. Um, just a couple of things to add um, in terms of what those reparations will look like, aside from, of course, the criminal convictions, the material compensation, things like that. It's the global accountability that will be reached that I think is is really what um, I would assume these families are most after because, you know, like we've heard so many times, never forgive, never forget. And to actually get that closure, like Massa just mentioned, that would be, you know, I think the, the biggest step forward. But just a couple of um, notes on ICAO. Um, if this does, in fact, reach the level of the International Court of Justice and there is convictions put in place, some of the actions that ICAO could actually take... You need take, to explain what ICAO is? The International, Organize, uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Mm -hmm. So some of the actions that they could actually take is that um, they could ask countries to impose restrictions on flying over Iranian airspace to the certain level of even completely um, avoiding it altogether. And so that would have severe implications for, for the Islamic Republic should they still be in power at that point. Right, right. So that's also something to note. And um, also a quick fact that I just wanted to give you guys is that um, there's only been two other um, complaints or international complaints brought against the Islamic Republic at The Hague since the 1979 revolution. The first one was the hostage taking of the U.S. Embassy in 1979, and the second was the Islamic Republic's military use of its offshore oil platforms in 2003. Hmm. Uh, Shia, I know that you're close with, um, uh, as we all are, know folks in the, the, amongst yes. the, the families of the, the victims, um, and you spoke to somebody yesterday who yes. was saw this as a, a moment to celebrate yes and uh, what he said to me actually it was very interesting he said that he spoke with uh, a couple of families and they were crying and they said that from now on if we die we die relaxed because we uh, we i can say we kind of did what we have to do in terms of justice yeah. wow, wow. Yeah. well that's you know, actually many parents died during this three years they never saw justice happening to their children yes. um yeah yes mm -hmm. i uh, should salute uh, them actually in in um hamed's uh video that he put out yesterday yeah. Hamed Ismail, he he says i'm dedicating this to the 27 uh, year old who, daughter yeah yeah who who has died a daughter of it's i mean so many people died on this flight some mm -hmm. of them are kids of people who are mm -hmm. the families of the victims some of them are are parents of the of the families uh, you know of, of and the victims. you know as we speak there is a demonstration by ikao today um wanting them to do more action D a demonstration at ICAO. Yeah, yeah. Not by ICAO. Okay. By, by the side of it. Right. I, by, by the building of it. <laughs> ICAO is not the one uh, demonstrating. It's, no, no, right, no. Right. No. Yeah, no, by yeah. the side of it. <laughs> um, anything you want to add on this? I mean, the the, the one thing that was, uh, you know, it's it's it's. I guess it embodies the idea of it's a marathon, not a sprint. To say, we're, it's six months. We're going to see if Iran responds to this. Because mm -hmm. that, I, to be clear, there's a. There's a complaint issued. Iran has six months to respond. If not, it goes to the court, right? Is yeah. that the way it works? Um, so uh, <laughs> part of that is just to go, oh, my God, another six months. Mm -hmm. these, poor, these poor families have to wait. But they seem okay with that. You know, they're okay. Like, we're on track now. We're, we're going somewhere. Is there anything besides the coming anniversary, Maso, uh, that um, we should be looking out for in the next six months that we get to this, go through this process? like legal actions i'm just wondering with regards to this this process is it now a matter of waiting to see if iran it should responds? be yeah because um 
these the group of uh, the group that is looking into it of the four countries that you mentioned mm -hmm. they uh, they are going to give Iran six more months to come up with um, clarity that is needed and it's um, it's not likely that they will mm. so after that it's going to go to the next step but before that there are other families who are taking a different path that might lead up to other stuff I don't know um, there are other courts that are looking into this matter by different families um, a group of other families have done other stuff so good to know yeah good to know let me get to a couple of the, the other items uh, on the that we've been looking at in the last two or three days um, with respect to the uprising and what's going on in, the, in both in the diaspora and inside Iran I wanted to bring up the idea of or the reality of the Iranian economic crisis um, again, because once again, I think this might be something that we have to talk about quite regularly because it's becoming a, a, a big issue daily. Once again, if you if you follow this stuff, you see that the Iranian currency continues to tank. Uh, inflation continues to grow. The currency continues to be devalued inside Iran. Um, what are the implications of this? Shaya. Um, what I can see in the like in at least my social media um, the implication is that like people forget about exchanging uh, uh, like buying stuff with money they they start to bartering and like I, I was curious if uh, it's happening I mean because I've seen several other stories that like one of my friend he wanted to sell his mixer to get some goosh, uh, some meat. sorry meat, yeah. Mm. And uh, I was curious if it's uh, like happened. A mixer like a mi mixing board. Mixing board, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and uh, so I, I looked it up and yeah, I looked it up and uh, there is an article on Shark newspaper which is inside of Iran and mm -hmm. actually. It's happening a lot these days that people just forget about money because they have they they're know. literally swapping goods mm -hmm. like a yes. a pre currency society mm -hmm. like a, yes. I'll bring you a blanket you give me some meat exactly yeah like a lot of people say that like I can a lot of I have a lot of books I give it for yeah, receiving eggs and there, there's a lot of advertisement like this and. They, they just, they know that their money doesn't have any value. You heard about this? I have, yeah, I have, but not as, the, in the extent that he's talking about, mm -hmm. like on social media. I've heard it as a joke. Um, I hope it's a joke still, because it's very sad for, for people of a mm -hmm. very modern country to be exchanging goods instead of money. Yeah, I, that's what I, I, I thought at the first that it's joke. Then I looked it up and no, it's not joke. I mean, there is a website like Kijiji in Iran. It's mm -hmm. called Divar. Divar, Divar yeah. Right now, it's a lot of this kind of advertising mm -hmm. yeah. that we... I mean, I think if there are people listening to us right now who are like... Um, my brother just went to Iran and came back and he chinadi. There was no big deal. What's yeah. the problem? We're not talking about, you know, the the entire country not uh, who's devolving the into this. Dollar to Iran. What's that? It's <laughs> definitely not someone who's traveling to Iran with the dollar, like U.S. or Canadian right. dollar. Of course, they're, they're not, not going to notice the issues, like right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or if you're visiting their our family in right. Tehran. Even, even the upper class of the people living in like north of Tehran yeah. they don't even notice that many of them they don't even care well that's part that's my point yeah, yeah. that 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 there are there will be people mm -hmm. i i was amongst a group of people last night who uh, a couple of them said oh we go back and forth to iran we don't see you know in fact the country has changed a lot you mm -hmm. know these are the kind of people who i, I didn't want to say too much because they were uh, we would have gotten to a big argument but they were they were sort of saying oh you know reforms have happened and these things take time and uh, I, I don't know if this revolution is going to happen but you don't really notice that much different than meantime these are very wealthy people mm -hmm. you know i mean as anywhere in the world you go you can live a pretty good life if you have the the resources yeah. right but i mean the, the reality is as much as we want to think or hope that it's a joke the reality is that there's been a 25 percent depreciation of the currency just since september 16th 2022 mm after the killing of Massa. So since that date till now, we've seen 25%. We know inflation is almost at 50%. I mean, these are statistics that we've been looking at for weeks, months, we've been talking about it. So we know it's a reality. And 
The irony in all of this is that the Islamic Republic blames the protests for the decline of the currency. That that was something that I read again recently that I that I just found laughable. Yeah, although that's not new. No, that's of what course. regimes do when they when there's protesters, everything becomes yeah. the fault of the protesters, mm-hmm. and yeah. But we do see that um, it is it is starting to ruffle a couple of feathers because we're starting to see and hear, um, I guess, rumors and things like that of Raisi moving people around within different cabinets. There's been, you know, very quiet firings and replacements of ministers. There's even rumblings of changes at top levels in the oil ministry, ministry of education. So these are all direct effects of you know, the economic crisis that's also going on. And there's also been a few stories that I've I've read in the last couple of days about uh, there being internal uh, debates amongst Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the regime, you know, that there's the reformists and the conservatives and they're starting to infight intra-regime arguments about how to deal with this. Should we start to reform and and change things to appease the people? I didn't want to bring that up because I don't know how much, it's hard to tell how much of this is real. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the stories get written and you sort of go, well, do you know that... but um, but if that is true on any level, it speaks to the disarray that is being uh, caused by mm-hmm. ongoing discontent of a population. Did you want to add something about the economy? Yes, I did actually. So um, after gold and uh, currency, the biggest thing, the the biggest inflation was on food, with sixty seven percent from twelve months ago until today. People were already living sixty percent under the poverty line um, last year when I did a report on it, and I I know for a fact that it was 60%, and Uh now I can't imagine Uh what the percentage is right now. These days, people who were only feeding on bread and maybe some eggs, I don't know what they have to eat these days. Yeah, yeah. So with the backdrop of that, um, uh, there are some more, there seems to be increasing movement of... um, calls for some kind of an opposition Mm -hmm. um, coalition. I mean, this has been in the air for a while now, but for in the last few days, and I can only say this anecdotally, not necessarily scientifically, but I've heard from my contacts that there's a lot of activity going on in terms Mm of um, some of the big names that we've heard of uh, coordinating with each other and, and trying to bring together some kind of united opposition uh, that can speak with one voice to at least the international media, to represent international institutions and bodies, and maybe even to the people in Iran from the outside to say, here's, you know, what we're all together and this is what we're um, counseling or suggesting or how we can help. Or uh, Are you hearing this? Yeah, I've been hearing this. Um, something that is good to look into is that um, the difference between last uprising of people with this one is that many group of many different uh, partisans, they have come together to only shout that they want regime change. And this is the way to look into it. And that's why people from different perspectives, they are coming together as well. And this has been something that people want. And when so many people want it, so many followers of, of one specific group, they ask for the same thing it brings people together. And I've seen it. I've seen it develop. I've seen it from the days that every party would do their own thing. Yeah. And now that they are only um, looking into a way to unite. Yeah. And it's beautiful. And I feel like, again, uh, this is not scientific. I'm not sure anybody could do this scientifically right now, even with great polling resources or something, because the diaspora is spread out and it's it's big and it's diverse. But, but I feel like the intolerance level from one camp to another notwithstanding the the antipathy towards the reformists like the nyack or whatever but did, but but the intolerance level for 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 example for some folks uh, you know who are fans of one one kind of an Ali Karimi or Hamid Ismaili towards uh, Reza Pahlavi and and the Reza Pahlavi supporters towards the Masi mm-hmm. I feel like that is going down not not that they don't love their choice of person mm-hmm. but that there is this appetite to okay let's get these guys together let's sort of whoever they are inside Iran as well let's bring together some kind of body because increasingly to me as well it feels like there needs to be some kind of direction that um, common direction that that we can all follow they, they, it, there's as much as we've we've gotten so excited about the the unity quote unquote that we have in the diaspora and, and we've heard about it within Iran wouldn't it be great if everybody came together and said on this day, 
you know, let's all go out on the streets mm-hmm. in and outside of Iran or whatever they want, you know, to, to kind of have us all on the same page. I would listen to that. Absolutely. I'd be part of that. So, um, so yeah, it seems like we're getting to that that moment. I think, you know, what's been so amazing to see, and I think this conversation that we keep having about unity and, you know, we had talked weeks before about why is it that we tear up at the sight of, you know, a, a, an organized demonstration in Berlin or when we see someone on the street with a flag, we, you know, get this overwhelming sense of pride and all of, all of these things is, is because this collective goal just to get rid of the Islamic Republic that everyone shares, regardless of what their beliefs or their choice of representative or whatever else may be, I think that that's the unifying factor and I think everyone's starting to realize that that is the of utmost importance and everything else takes kind of a step down to that yeah yeah um let's put our our bickering aside for exactly. a little bit and, and and focus on the the goal and as long as the goal includes self-determination for Iranians within Iran I mean can we can we all get behind that mm-hmm. I mean that seems like it's a a no-brainer um, keeping the borders of Iran keeping it you know I mean it, it seems like these things could be very commonly agreed upon so um, before we end up the the roundtable uh, and again mass I'm glad you're here from a media organization because I I wanted to mention something as well that as somebody who did work in mainstream media for a while um, maybe it's because I I was weaned onto these guidelines and, and awareness around what what is effective or what shouldn't be done in, in media what can be harmful um, there was an event a couple of days ago where uh, an Iranian student in France died by uh, suicide. Uh, this was a couple of days ago, and um, social media went in all kinds of different directions after this, and um, it uh, it was very disturbing to me. And I I did post something on my Instagram saying that it is perhaps worth reminding ourselves uh, in a in a moment like this that a substantial body of research suggests that media reports about people who have died by suicide, as well as the topic of suicide in general, can influence vulnerable people um, and is associated with higher subsequent rates of suicide. You get a copycat kind of activity happening. So um, so on this Instagram post that I shared a couple of days ago, I shared some of the media guidelines that I I remembered from um, that were provided by the Canadian Psychiatric Association um, from two or three years ago. Uh, they're not anything that any thinking person should be that surprised by necessarily, but the bottom line is, um, don't don't overdo it in terms of talking about this. Don't don't um, sensationalize it. Don't make it seem heroic, and don't glamorize it, um, because we're we're you know we're talking about an activity that um, falls into a very very dark and difficult category that can. Um, can have a great effect on other vulnerable people who might be in that in that position. Now, as soon as I posted that, and, and I saw others, uh, there were there was a lot of psychologists and like psychiatrists, uh, some of whom we've had on the show, posting about this, quite concerned about this. But I thought that um, I would just bring this up to for us to talk about it because in this wild world of social media right now with the Iranian diaspora, everybody's hungry to look for ways mm-hmm. to show that things are moving along or there's support or something dramatic is happening and that can sometimes lead to some difficult paths that we have to kind of check ourselves on go ahead Shia. yeah i mean i completely agree with you i was worried actually when i saw that news that oh uh, it's not a good news i hope people stop to uh, again as you said stop to making a hero out of this because uh, I, I respect that guy, uh, rest in peace, but I think what he's done, I, I, I cannot accept that act. We, we need uh, our people. The second slogan is Zan Zendegi Azadi. So you cannot like let go of your life, the most precious thing that you have. In terms of uh, raising awareness, you can find the something that then we celebrate together after victory. we don't want that to become the option that mm-hmm. yes. people choose to and help the revolution somehow and again i know a lot of people in my close circle that they are ha- i know that they have some suicidal uh, thought and it it it, wo- it just worry worried me that yeah, yeah it could affect them you know? yeah. as a as a media we also have guidelines on that 
So as a piece of news, we have to broadcast it, mm-hmm. but we have to be very careful not to cherish it, not to um, make it something mm, normal. And uh, every time our our presenters talked about it or our reporters reported about that, they only mentioned what's that, what what has happened, and they have reported things on the social media. But we also do have guidelines. And as a person, I had my thoughts on whether I should think of this um, young person as a hero or, you know, because it, it puts so much pressure on people who are already vulnerable and they're thinking of a way to look like a hero and say goodbye to the world, that it really worries me that this is going to become something that more people are going to look into it. And I really stopped doing anything on it. I didn't post anything. I didn't talk about it. I didn't do a report on it. I just stayed out of it. As a person, one of the things that is a is a, a reality of our age is that, especially when uh, our this time period, I mean, is that especially around this this moment and and the Iranian uprising, etc., a lot of people are getting their information via social media platforms. Mm-hmm. So, say Instagram, it's a news source. You know, it's a it's a way you're fi- or Twitter or something like you're finding out what's going on. And those platforms do not discriminate between what the official news agencies are and what somebody in their basement is posting. They're all, they all look the same. All mm-hmm. the posts look the same. So even with the due respect to, to a, a, a network that might be doing its due diligence, um, people are not waiting around for the six o'clock news to get the official word. Right. They're just seeing it in their, in their platforms. And so, um, yeah, to me, it was just a, it was a, an avalanche of all kinds of stuff being said. Can it said, be flagged? You know. Can it be flagged on Instagram? If so many people report it, then it can be flagged. I guess it's, so. It's a yeah. threat to people. Yeah, yeah. It was. It, I, I shouldn't say. I mean, it was. It was. When I say there was a diversity, it, it wasn't just romanticizing this yeah. either. It was. There was a lot of ways in which this event was being amplified mm-hmm. uh, that it just is it's a little too delicate there's not a lot of thought going into this guys like you know let's let's be careful here uh, go ahead Tiger. yeah um, I actually you know like you said I, I had kind of seen this video floating around and there was a lot of people who were posting on it um, through social media um, and I actually reshared one of the posts myself um, and I was so angry at seeing the news of this individual um, taking his own life and things coming to that point. Things coming yeah. to that point. Yeah, I was just so angered by all of it, and it was just almost like another, I don't know, last straw, so to speak, in everything that's kind of been accumulating up until this point. And when I saw that video and the, and the thought process behind me resharing it and kind of putting my own commentary was on it was that anger was it was coming from that place of anger and and I had kind of written you know what my thoughts on it were and the fact that this individual had felt that that was kind of the last resort and and you know all these things, and then I actually saw your post, and I think after reading some of the guidelines and reading what you had written, I thought about it and I removed my post and I thought you know there's no point in 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 resharing it because of those concerns, because of those individuals who may be at that vulnerable stage. But, you know, I I do want to emphasize that feeling that I had initially, because, you know, it's something we've talked about for months, and it's horrific. I mean, I can't even think of another word that so many of us are feeling so helpless, and we, you know, our emotions are all over the place. We're constantly trying to um, find any sort of news or any sort of update on what's happening and so many of us are so far away we don't even have you know contact or regular contact with people who are inside Iran that our minds go all sorts of places so I think it's important to also think about you know the feelings that we have when we see things like this yeah I mean maybe there's a maybe there's a simple rule that isn't gonna it's gonna sound quite simple but which is to ask oneself before posting something, mm-hmm. how is this? Is this going to help? Yep. How is this going to help? But I mean, you know, and look, there's. I've cited that there are studies. Um, there's a substantial body of research again that suggests 
this is what the, the pattern is. Mm-hmm. You 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 talk about this stuff. You you sensationalize it. It can influence vulnerable people and, and lead to higher subsequent rates of suicide. But that's not an absolute. It may be different for it's. It is different for different for people. Sure. There may be people who believe that we should be talking about this directly and and that we shouldn't, um, uh, you know, heed those kind of guidelines, etc. Um, it, but it really is important to think about this in advance of, I think, in, in advance of posting this stuff because we're in such a emotion-driven, mm-hmm. animated kind of uh, angry uh, uh, place uh, as a as a people, as a as a diaspora, uh, that. Um, uh, you know the the terms like mob mentality and stuff it's like what you know when you sort of lose perspective because everybody's there's such a frenzy of action mm-hmm. and that's that's kind of like the way the information was was um in a tidal wave coming out all over social media about this event and this guy and 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 all the commentary around it um felt felt um dangerously um untethered it was you know really kind of uh uh for for something that is such a vulnerable type of event again maybe that maybe i'm just old school has been drilled into me by my media training but but for right away for me it was like oh boy this is a this is kind of the opposite of what we've been told is is helpful Mm -hmm. and you know i was saying to you guys earlier you live in a place like toronto there's a reason why there's a reason why you never hear news about people jumping in front of a train. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it doesn't, it's not because it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Nope. <laughs> it's because society has decided that is not a helpful thing to be amplifying. You know, mm-hmm. to be so um, especially during Christmas and New Year. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also there is. I, I have to mention there is a false information that people uh, think that in Eastern philosophy, like suicidal act actually is glorified but it's not true i mean it actually somebody told me that no it's that's not, not that, no, that, no, that, no. well you got in the west you know that this is a bad thing but actually in uh, no, there, there iran is, or something no that's no no there is one act that like for example you um, you uh, throw yourself into i mean you um bomb it you like cover yourself with bomb and uh-huh. go to the suicide uh, bomber a mar- martyr uh, you become yeah. a martyr yeah but this wasn't like this was a suicide this was suicide i don't know it a- anyway it's not glorified in eastern philosophy like ki- I- even in islam like cli- self killing uh, suicide uh, committing suicide is the higher sin that you can come into. So the thing that maybe we can all agree on is that uh, it is profoundly sad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is just incredibly sad that... There was this one comment, sorry to cut you off, on Twitter about this um, that I found very true. It was that even though this guy lived in France and he, as he mentioned in his video, he had a good life, he had good income and everything, but he was still killed by the Islamic Republic, mm-hmm. because the, uh, he was like, um, he, it was the last straw. That, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Last yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's 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 comment. what's so sad. It, it, yeah. It, yeah. No, no matter which way you shake it, and what we should and shouldn't be saying yep. in the media, um, it's definitely devastating that that mm-hmm. anyone mm-hmm. is in that kind of headspace, based on what this friggin. Uh, uh, regime has done and what and what we've seen in the last 44 I, years. I want to remind that Zan Zendegi Azadi, as he mentioned, it's woman life, freedom. So if you're cherishing life, you shouldn't do this. Yeah, and we need everybody alive, man. Yeah. We need everybody alive. This is, we need, we need, this is. We need people. We need people that, yeah. We, 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 they can shout. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I think it was somebody said, I think it was Airphone or somebody had posted something, uh, our rapper friend, who said, uh, you know this revolution the only way we this exists and the only way we can keep this going is that for it to be about hope mm-hmm. it would there would be no revolution if it wasn't about hope yeah. Yeah. um and and so that has to be the prime directive keep yes. keep you know keep the hope alive yeah. keep the hope alive i think it's a, a really good time to quote uh hamid Ismailion. No, Don't right? mourn, organize. That's what we need. Timely, timely. Yeah. That was the way he let off his uh, exactly. mm-hmm. video about the, the the new developments with respect to mm-hmm. the international court and all and of that. And I believe that they did. They did. All the families of like PS752, regardless of different directions that they went, 
they did organize mm-hmm. and they tried they tried really hard yeah mm-hmm. although they've also done their fair share of mourning I know. Uh, when we're in the on this 40th day cycle there's a bunch of 40 days yeah. of uh, kids dying today as well and, and it's impossible not to mourn you mm-hmm. know uh, so um, but the point is really well taken Massa it's such a pleasure to have you here again thank, thank you. you it's always good when you're here you're so informative we really appreciate you and the work that you do thank you Pega thank, thank you. you Shia let's thank get you. to our first guest my first guest is an Iranian German physician, journalist, and author, Gilda Sahebi, was born in Iran, moved to Germany at the age of three. She obtained her education in medicine and political science as a journalist. Gilda writes and reports about anti-Semitism, racism, women's rights, and the Middle East with a focus on Iran. And since the beginning of the current uprising in Iran, she has been very outspoken, creating content, guesting in various media, reporting on the protests, arrests, and executions. And this past week, the German media magazine medium awarded her the distinction of journalist of the year in the field of politics and right now gilda sahibi joins me from the south of germany today hello hi jan hi thank you so much for coming on the program it's good to have you uh you you're you're quite prolific although sometimes i can't understand what what you're saying because it's all in german in your social media <laughs> but i i do understand i use the google translate i understand that you're you've been doing great work and and congratulations on this um this major journalist prize you've just won in 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 germany that must be a big deal for you thank you yeah i think it's also uh, an acknowledgement of what's going on in iran so it does mean a lot, yeah. You are a doctor and an award-winning journalist. That really does seem like some next-level Persian overachiever stuff. Do the two worlds intertwine at all? Does your medical background help you at all in your work as a very active journalist these days? Well, I have taken a huge interest in, in what the situation of doctors, you know, medical staff has been in Iran in the past few months. And it's awful. It's really, really bad. And there have been a lot of solidarity from the medical community in Germany, for sure. Like there was another video that was published today where physicians demanded that the medical staff, doctors, nurses, everyone is not, um, you know, persecuted, killed. We've seen everything put under pressure it's just the situation of people who just want to help who want to do their job who want to heal and help people we had this horrible case of Ayla Rustami this young doctor she was 36 years old and she just vanished after her shift in the hospital um and then the uh, police brought her body back to her family the next morning and told them that she had an accident and her bones were crushed her body was crushed and she had been helping people who have been hurt during the protests and that's why she was murdered yeah we we were talking about this with dr k um on this on the show a couple of weeks ago it really is high on the list of the most obscene or maybe absurd atrocities taking place in iran right now that doctors who are simply trying to do their job you know, not even necessarily taking a political position, um, can risk being arrested, detained, uh, tortured, the whole gamut, I suppose, by um, the, it's seen as somehow cooperative if they're healing protesters? Yeah, I mean, the the completely like horrible thing about this is usually in crises, there is special security for medical staff right they get access they get security they it it is made sure that they can help people and what's happening around is the exact different uh, like the opposite of what what should be happening and also they are misused for you know they have to lie about all kind of diagnoses like they they it started with Gina Massa Amini where the doctors were supposed to say that she died from a heart attack or whatever that was or brain tumor it's like the stories keep changing and so it really, right now, it's just being a doctor in Iran right now or being any kind of, doing any kind of medical profession. It's just, you need to have courage in these times. And, and they are really rising up to that. And also, you know, the, the, the CNN report about sexual abuse in prisons and in, by police, by Revolutionary Guard, everyone. The only, the only cause that we know about this is because medical staff has given us this information and they're risking their lives by doing that. Yeah. 
And it's the, the amount of courage that these people have is just astounding to me. And by the way, um, this is coming on the heels of two years, three years of COVID, which yes. we all know famously, infamously, uh, was handled in interesting ways in Iran, but really had the doctors on the front lines in Iran, um, the, the way they've been all over the world, but uh, in dangerous positions. And, and so it has been a, a, a precarious, a harrowing time to be a doctor uh, in Iran in, the, in recent years. Yeah, and I mean, during COVID, the regime did everything to make it harder and more horrible for people. I'm convinced, I have no proof of that, but I'm convinced that the, the people on top, they got their great vaccines and everything they needed. But they they it took, like they banned Pfizer and Moderna, everything from Iran. The, like it's, Iran was actually one of the first countries that, that got hit really hard. That was before in Europe and in North America was hit because they have this huge like back and forth between China and Iran because they're like Ahunda coming from China now also mm -hmm. and China has huge interest in Iran and so it started there super early and it was not handled people had to get treatment for themselves a lot of people died there was a lot of uprising about that too that they just lost their relatives one after another and this this alone just shows how dictatorships they don't care about people they yeah. never do they really never do yeah i i said earlier in the show that i've been looking forward to having you on because i want to talk about germany uh in this moment uh the role of germany iranian germans and the eu in general um, which has been a big part of what's been going on in the diaspora in terms of how to respond, support, or um, maybe not uh, support the the uprising in Iran. Before we get there, let me just ask you, as someone who has worked in the media in this space, um, uh, human rights, women's rights, the Middle East, Iran, um, when this happened starting in September, the, the, the killing of Massa Amini, was this revolution in Iran that is currently um, in motion something that you would have anticipated? No. I think because the last couple of years after 2019 in the Aban protest where hundreds of people were killed on the streets in just a matter of days, there was a huge resignation among especially young people. And I, I was one of them. Like I remember... Also, because no one reported on it, no one mm. cared. I remember I tried to to write about it and say, like after Soleimani was killed, I wrote this article that we should not negotiate with these people and we can't just keep on working on the JCPOA on the nuclear deal, like nothing happened. And the German foreign minister, minister back then, he called upon both sides not to, to like to restrain themselves. And I was like, which? What do you mean? Like which both sides? And that was. That was the way people were talking about this here. And like Jose and Runari, I think you mentioned it on the show some sometime, Pegan mentioned it. He wrote this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last year where he said the media is telling is not telling you the truth about Iran, and that was the same here. And I had a really hard time to get that article published because no one wanted to know about Iran. No one wanted to know what's going on. And this regime has been has had impunity for 44 years. And I think this whole no one cares and we're alone. I think a lot of people in Iran had that and I had that because I like a lot of people were just leaving Iran. Everyone just wanted to leave Iran and, and I and I get it. Like how I remember I don't know if you remember there was this dating app that the regime had developed that was in 2020 or 21, which is like this whole you should read up on it. I think Hamdan was the name or something like that. Anyway, so they developed this this dating app where, you know, you get two people together and of course they have to get married very quickly. And then you get this this Islamic counselor to go through you through marriage. And they did that because people stopped getting married and people yes. stopped having children. And yeah. I talked to some people, some young people back then, and one of them told me, Why would I ever put a child in this prison of con of of a country? And so I did not see that coming. I, I didn't know. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting that you bring that up because the, the, it's called white marriage in some uh, some cases. The the idea that there's young Iranians who are cohabitating um, and not getting married and doing this in defiance of 
of the official laws. And, and that's been a trend in recent years. We did a special on it on this show. And it's things like that that give a nod to the fact that there is a, a generation, um, the, a, a new young generation that is basically saying, we don't give a fuck about what your laws are and uh and it, it is it is only because of that attitude that this thing has continued right i mean otherwise if it was yeah. the green movement attitude it would be well or even all bond sadly well that we've been beaten back we have to retreat maybe we'll come back for another day but this thing has continued for four months because it's it's a uh, it's literally do or die for for young people uh, who have tremendous courage in doing that would you agree yes and it it's not new like this we had that in 1981 we had that in 1988 where you had thousands of young people who said the exact same things that people are saying today i was just researching like there's this amazing book, book it's called <laughs> voices of a massacre um and they just they they tell the stories of the mass murders in in the 80s and i was just so like sad and grieving because we the young people in iran have done that for 44 years and they said they said i want to, i'm i'm going to give my life so that the next generation is yeah. going to be free they said that 44 years ago 43 and, and 40 years ago well, and the difference is go sorry ahead, go ahead you go ahead <laughs> The difference now is that we are watching them. Mm. We did not watch 44 years ago and 40 years ago. No one was watching. Like they were able to do this, these horrendous crimes without anyone knowing about it or even caring about it. But now we have their names. Like we didn't know any names uh, of the, of the killed prisoners back then, but we know them now. We know all, like not all their names, but a lot of their names. We have their pictures. We know, you know, their TikTok videos. We know how they lived, how they loved. And so hopefully this time they can't get away with it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. I mean, there, there was no oxygen to these kind of um, statements and, and demonstrations in the past. It was, it, they would get crushed. It's like trying to light a flame in a, in, in a windstorm. And, and the, the oxygen now uh, exists partly in, in, because of the numbers, but you're, you're right. I mean, we shouldn't, we should be mindful not to, um, not to dismiss the the thousands and thousands who gave their lives, certainly through the 1980s, all those executions, um, in the cause of trying to fight this regime at that point. Um, but but this notion that reform really isn't going to be um, the answer, isn't going to be possible, is something that is has become much more, maybe not universal just yet. Obviously, we know that there are still uh, elements out there in the diaspora talking about it uh, and, and and aching for it, it seems. But um, but this idea that reform is not the answer is is something that has really crystallized in the last three or four years, uh, maybe since 2017, 2019, all bond. Uh, and it really makes a difference this time. Let me ask you, let me, let's segue into Germany, because as I was saying, I've been looking forward to having you on because of all the, the activism in the Iranian diaspora emanating from the EU and particularly from Germany. And I wanted to ask you about Germany and the German role in all of that. Um, so let's take it step by step. First of all, I know there are a lot of Iranians living in Germany and no doubt not a uniform group, depending on the city or region. But overall, Gilda, if you were to say, how would you describe the Iranian German community in the last four months since the uprising began in Iran? It's been super strong. I think you haven't seen anything like the Iranian German activists in any other EU country. There are demonstrations almost every week. And I don't know any German Iranian anymore who's not active. And we saw this huge protests in, in October 22nd in Berlin, 80 to 100,000 people. And there's this, this, uh, they call them, the, the name is uh, Women Life Freedom Collective, and they are incredibly active and really so many people. And it's important. We, and we have not seen that in other countries of the European Union, which means that the, the issue of Iran is not as big. It does make a huge difference. And the German Iranian community has been incredibly active. Also, this whole political um, sponsorship, that's where it started. And it's it's huge, and it just goes to show how important activism is in this field. 
And I report on it and I watch it and I just see the impact that these people have and the impact that demonstrations have and civil, civil, any kind of civil engagement. And I'm, and I don't know if it's the same level in North America, definitely not in the States. Like from my, from what I've been seeing Mm -hmm. is that Iran has not really been any kind of issue in the United States, more in Canada, of course, but even there, I think it's not as much as in Germany. I'm not sure you you would know better. Well, in in, in Toronto, obviously, we we have a great deal of activism. We had that massive, you know, we yeah. had our own eighty thousand people protest here, uh, and and it's the same thing, regular, weekly, etc. Of course, in the city of Toronto, the Greater Toronto Area. Um, happens to be a massive. It's probably the next to LA, the biggest uh, um, metropolitan uh, area of Iranian diaspora density in the world now. So, so uh, th- it's reflective of that. I'm curious if, if just because um, obviously, I mean, we we know that there are Iranians in Germany. We've had a few. We had uh, you know the great filmmaker Ali Samedi Ahadi on the show. Others who we've spoken to have been in Ger- Ger- Germany. Natalie Amiri, the journalist, but. Uh, would you say that this has been a catalyst for the unification of Iranian Germans? In other words, w- did you see this kind of um, um, outspoken demonstration of a community there before? No, 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 not in that way. Even me, like I said, that was some sometime around spring this year. I, I told a friend of mine, you know, I wish I had more Iranian friends. And then like four months later, I before I had like two and now I have like a hundred. <laughs> like the networks that have been forming the past three months, three and a half months, amazing. Like just everyone coming together. And also, of course, they're, you know, they're Iranians. There are going to be differences everywhere and all the time. They like, they can't really kind of restrain themselves. They just have to argue a lot. But usually when you say, listen, if people in Iran can come together and die for one another and die for people in Kurdistan and Sistan Baluchistan and just be together, then you should really be able to. And I feel like this thought and this energy has really changed something. And there's just a really a, a feeling of understanding and being together and holding and standing together. I want to get into the specifics of what um, the, the German government and authorities have and haven't done uh, and discuss that with you. But but first of all, you mentioned the October 22nd um, massive, epic, landmark uh, protest event that happened in Berlin. What kind of effect did that have, not just on the community, but some kind of rippling effect or legacy that it would have had on lawmakers in Germany? Was that was would you would you pinpoint that as a wake up moment? I, I wouldn't say it's one moment. I think it's first of all is it's what's happening in Iran. We've seen the most horrid, you know, reports coming out of there and. The incredible courage of people, of women, of young girls, like uh, October was the month of Gen Z, right? There were like girls in school taking off their hijab and doing incredible, like just incredible things. And um, so, and a lot of things have been happening. But of course, what the big protests and also the, you know, the notion and the understanding that this is not going away that also people in, in Germany are not going to stop protesting. They're not just going to forget about it as everyone did about Afghanistan. Like last year, everyone right. was talking about Afghanistan. And a year later, it's like, what, whatever happened there? Right. And I think that is what, what's putting pressure, a lot of pressure on politics. Okay, so I'm so grateful to have you on the program because sometimes we see and hear things from outside of a country that may not be necessarily seen the way those who are a little closer to the action or um, in the know might see things. Like, for example, uh, we are told, uh, I see others from outside of Canada, for example, saying, look at the way Canada is leading the way in, in uh, you know, fighting this regime, whereas those of us who are in Canada um, uh, oftentimes lament the fact that uh, our government and authorities are not doing more, in fact, still haven't, for example, put the IRGC fully on the terrorist list. So we hear a lot about how progressive Germany has been leading the charge against Iran. Like, for example, we just heard about German authorities closing economic ties with Iran. Is that true? Or is the image of Germany being this active in fighting the regime a bit overblown? I think you need to be very careful about 
um, what is said, because what it, what is said is not the same as what is being done. So, for instance, this uh, closing economic ties, this headline, when you look at it, it's basically it's mostly about warranties for investment and export export to Iran from Germany. And they said, we're not going to give any warranties anymore, like the government, which is great. But the thing is, there have been hardly any applications for warranties since 2018 anyways. Hmm. Like, like companies do not want to invest in Iran for a long time since basically the U.S. pulled out of the uh, JCPOA. So it sounds good. It's I guess it's not bad, but it's not really going to change anything. And And so I think... Also, like with Canada, the the ten the number ten thousand that Trudeau said right in the beginning, great number. Where's the list? What are the names? Like, are they going to be stopped when they enter Canada? I don't think so. From what I have heard, that there is no list, and so it 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 sounds good. And also Trudeau coming like in in, in this protest with Hamid Ismailian and like saying, "I'm standing with you. I'm walking with you," or our foreign minister like saying. We know their names, you know, she said, Minu, Omid, like all of these Persian names. Sounds good too, but what does that mean? Well, what didn't, the, didn't the, the chancellor or somebody just meet with Ali Karimi? The the president, yeah. Okay. And yeah. is that, do we do we consider that a victory somehow? <laughs> I met him too a few weeks ago. That was, you know, he, he meets people. You know, we have to remember though, this president, he sent a congratulations letter to the Iranian regime in 2019, congratulating them on 40 years of revolution. So, you know. So you, you, met the, has, you, you met the president a few weeks ago or Ali Karimi? The president. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, did not meet Ali Karimi. Did you, did you have a conversation with him about why he congratulated the regime? No, I did not ask him that. Oh. But we, we like I was there with a group of Iranians, and we just discussed, you know, the protests, and and he was very interested, and it was a good talk, and it's good that he's meeting Ali Karimi, and it's but you can see it with like Macron, right? He met Nasi Alinejad, yeah. which is great, and then he was the first uh, head of state who talked about a revolution in Iran, great, but then like he goes and and talks to he's, a, he's, a, Yon, he's in the, the club lounge with the foreign minister uh, yeah. uh Iran foreign minister yeah yeah uh, what what is your feeling about political guardianships that seem to have begun in Germany this was all the the rage a couple of weeks ago we were all talking about this and and hopefully it does provide some kind of lifeline for those on death row um this is this is the act of official politicians or political figures or lawmakers um somehow sponsoring or becoming the patrons of those who are being detained uh who are at risk of ex execution etc in iran so that it amps up the pressure on the possibility of uh the the regime doing anything to them um what, tell, tell me about your perspective on this i think it's amazing I, we have seen death sentences lifted because of that, although the re regime, of course, would never admit that it has anything to do with it. I have observed uh, political sponsors. They are so engaged. They write letters to the embassy, to the Iranian ambassador. They write letters to their to the people who are in prison and hope you never know if they get to them, but they really, really care. And they are on it every single day. Like they, they tweet about it like 20 times a day. And they really, it's like they're really taking them on, these people. And this goes back to what I said before. You know, the, the, the regime in Iran, they have never, ever been confronted with their own crimes, ever. Like people who make all the decisions and, and who get the money and who get rich on, on, on people dying and killing people, they don't see the pictures of the, of the kids that they kill. Mm -hmm. They don't see what happens in prison. Now they do see. And these sponsorships are one part of this because they confront them all the time with their crimes. And hopefully, at some point, these these perpetrators, they're going to think, oh, shit, you know, if I keep doing this, yeah. I might have to pay for it one day. So the question of, you know, being seen and the question of we're not looking away this time. They looked away for 44 years. It's They're not looking away anymore. And it does make a huge difference. That's really heartening to hear. Um, let me ask you about the nuclear deal. We, we, we. Uh, I often think about the JCPOA, the, this nuclear deal, the resuscitation of it. 
and the possibility of it being something to do with the United States. So the conversation is usually what's the Biden administration doing? What's uh, Mali saying? What's uh, Blinken signaling? What? Where is the U.S. on this? But of course, the U.S. isn't the only actor in this. Uh, uh, do, do, is it your sense that um, despite the protesta- protestations of Iranians everywhere in the world that that the German government is still interested in doing some kind of deal with Iran? That is a very good question, because uh, yesterday, actually, the speaker of the foreign minister, he said that they are not focusing on the deal. They they have no interest and there is no cause for them to, to want it to be like revived. And they're focusing on the people on the street. That was quite a big announcement because just before the EU, like the high representative of EU who deals with like foreign foreign um, affairs, Joseph Borrell, he met the Iranian foreign minister last week in Jordan. And he doesn't go without a mandate. Like he has to do what the European countries tell him. So the, the foreign ministry saying that we do not follow that lead basically, I don't understand yet. I don't understand, is that them distancing themselves from this? Mm. Because they can't really do that because the EU foreign politics is shaped together, the foreign policy. Or is it, again, just something that sounds good? I really don't know yet. I I sent them an inquiry today and I'm (laughs) I'm waiting for it. Um, But we like the past three months, what I have heard from, from German officials was always we it's, you know, we are not talking about the JCPO, JCPOA, there are no negotiations. And now the EU, on the EU level, they, they say openly, we do negotiate. And already has there been an AIEA um, group in Tehran two weeks ago. So these are very, very mixed yeah. signals. Yeah. And But what I hear from Iran, Nians, when I talk, like I, I talk to people in Iran every day, it's like they're backstabbing us. And I get it. I really get it. Yeah. There's certainly, with all these whispers, it certainly isn't dead. That and no. and, and and sadly, yeah. um, that's quite sad because it's not just whether the merits of the nuclear deal. It's that it's that it really suggests these administrations in the West have not bought into the idea that of regime change no. in Iran. It really that you know that true. that's that's yeah. the bottom line, and and it's it's pretty devastating for. Iranians who, uh, back to that slogan that I feel like I have to repeat on every show, you know, we're not looking for you to save us, just stop saving the murderers, you know, yeah. uh, and, and this is where it falls into that category. Uh, let me turn the question around, uh, Gilda, what do you believe Germany could be doing better? What could the EU do better in Germany? Germany is, is a very major player in the EU and the EU is not putting the IRGC on the terrorist list and they belong there. They have to be there and they, they have all kinds of explanations why they're not doing it. But what I believe and what makes most sense to me is because of the JCPOA, because if the, the revolutionary guards are on the terror list, this is going to make the, the deal, the nuclear deal impossible. And also in the future, there will be no trade possible with with Iran mm. between Iran and EU. So that will be one of the first important steps. And then also, when you look at the sanctions that the EU has put forward, there have been three rounds of sanctions since September. It's a joke. Like it's like under 146 individuals and 12 organizations. When you look at Russia, there are 410 organizations alone, yeah. and all kind of like hundreds of individuals. And they have not done that with Iran. The regime that like, I, I like to say, you know, they're even in one, one part of Tehran, there are more murderers than these 146, you know, this, you can, you can basically put almost all people in parliament on the sanctions list, yeah. but they, they are not doing that. And that is really important because as long as these people in the regime that are doing like they're part of this crime machine they're part of you know just an execution imagine how many people are involved in this you know the, the, from putting like signing the papers up to the guy who's gonna actually execute 
and you have to make like you and as i said before with this with the canada list the canadian list you need names mm. you need to put names on this list and this has still not happened uh, it's it's really helpful and um educational to talk to you i hope you'll you'll come back i really appreciate um the perspective you're giving us from the the heart of uh, the, the middle of europe there uh before I let you go, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about. One of them you had, you had brought up to me in an earlier conversation you and I had, which you said you're concerned about disinformation uh, and fake news, um, in uh, particularly in the media and social media, and particularly how spreading disinformation can be used by the Islamic Republic regime. Tell me about your concerns. I'm just thinking we think we're also seeing this with the executions. Uh, so, for instance, uh, one night it's like tomorrow, uh, Muhammad Kobadlu is going to be executed and everyone is worried and everyone uses the hashtag. And then the next day, oh no, and it's not going to happen. And, and, and then, you know, this death, death sentence is lifted. Oh no, 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 it's not lifted. Like the regime wants to make people tired. They want to crush people. Darun. They want to make them Darun, basically. And, Fake news and disinformation is helping them do that because we've seen all kinds of fake news, like this misinf misinformation. Like um, they they would use old footage of protests uh, and take them, mm. you know, that happened today, which which didn't, you know. Or they say uh, the Iranian regime used chemical weapons in Kurdistan. There is no proof of that, and so as long. As this happens, it's only it only helps the regime because it discredits the protesters and the movement and the people. Because at some point, no one's going to know what what's real anymore, and that only helps the regime. So it's really important to verify every single information and to make sure that it's true. For instance, I had a, a someone, and I've I've I thought I've I've done research on that for a while now, but I still haven't found any proof that they take organs from dead prisoners yeah and that's i believe but i have no proof and until we have proof we can't make that claim and it's really important because this regime especially if you know its history it's it's horrible enough it is like it does the worst things that you can ever mm. ever imagine mm. it really dark it's bad enough evil. we don't have to make stuff up we don't have to make anything yeah, yeah. but but so, uh, but it's not but uh, you know just to push back gently on this i mean because i'm it's confusing i mean first of all i would say the mass majority i'm going to assume i'm that of of folks in social media you're you know a, an iranian canadian sitting in calgary who sees this thing on social media and says oh my god this person's about to be executed be our voice amplify all of those things that we've been repeating over and over again you know so they put that on social media they're doing that out of a good intention they're trying to help right so yeah how are we yeah. supposed to navigate between who is going to be executed and who isn't going to be executed i mean we sort of um we we and 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 one thing I should put an asterisk on as somebody who's worked in media for years myself too is there are Iranian media networks that put news out there that we assume is going through the same kind of fact checking as some of the major Western media networks, which are all not perfect and all have their own agendas. Yes, a disclaimer, but but that don't go through that that vigorous kind of fact checking exercise. But again, back to the person in Calgary, um, you know, they, well, this network is saying that, so this major TV network is saying that, so I guess I have to believe it's true, and so I have to get on social media and say yeah. stop the execution, and then it doesn't happen, and I can see exactly what you're saying in terms of the regime um, exhausting us with this, um, but how are we supposed to navigate that? That's like with the executions, just to make that very, very clear, you always go out and say it. Like never, when someone says someone's going to be executed tomorrow, you're going to put you to use the hashtag. Okay, it doesn't matter because it can't. Like how do how are you supposed to know if it's going to happen or not? Like well, you with the use that as an example of how fake news can help the Islamic Republic. Yeah, but that's not like I wouldn't put that under fake news. I'm just saying how they want to use it. Oh. Like they want to make people tired. They want to make people not listen anymore. But with the executions, you always go out and you always use the hashtags. Okay, because if you don't, then these people like are not gonna be anywhere. We saw that with Mohsen Shekari, the first man, uh, young man who was executed. 
the family was told not to say his name to anyone, not to you know to keep silent, and they did, and they just executed him. Yeah. And his name was nowhere. No one talked about it. So, with the executions, yes, even the tenth time you go out, and the tenth time, and the twentieth time, you're gonna say their name because they, especially people on death row and people who are in in danger of being executed, they we need to know their names. Okay. I'm just saying just as that was just an example for the mechanism, you know, the, the, the regime uses, like, I believe that they themselves put out a lot of fake news because they mm. want to discredit the opposition. Mm. And the fact checking goes to us, right? It doesn't go to, to, no, to, to not media people. They, how would they, how, of course, they're going to trust media outlets and media outlets, Iranian ones in, in exile are really, really good. They have incredibly good fact checkers. And so you can trust those. But you look at the sources where you get the news from. That's all I'm saying. Hmm. All right. A staunch defense of the Iranian media networks outside of Iran. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, they make mistakes uh, like I, any I may, other media, I, right? I may need to hold you to that at some point, but, 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 uh, but I appreciate what you're saying. Listen, um, before I let you go, uh, where do you where do you believe Gilda that, that, that this revolution is headed as we're we're moving into 2023 it it won't come as any surprise to you that a lot of the uh and maybe this is a part and parcel of the exhaustion you're talking about a lot of the 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 inspirational momentum that seemed to exist through October and November that was culminating in things like that massive Berlin demonstration um, the inspiration that led many of us to be saying things like the rebirth of Iranian pride still still there still significant a lot of that feels right now um, somewhat suppressed we're in a bit of a lull there's people concerned that there aren't millions on the streets in Iran what's going to happen I try to say revolutions don't happen in three months. They take time and and there's going to be ups and downs. But what is your feeling um, about where we're at and where we're headed as we go into a new year? Well, first of all, I I am convinced that that the majority of people in Iran want to see this regime disappear. They want to see it go away. And from what the conversations that I've been having with people in Iran in the past few weeks since the executions, basically, it's just, it's, it's going to happen. And I, and I asked them, so I told them, like one friend of mine, she's, she always goes to the protests. And I told her, do you know that, that like Western governments don't believe it's going to happen? And she was surprised. <laughs> she was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, you know, they don't believe in the revolution. She was like, of course it's going to happen. But the thing is, of course, as was with the revolution in seventy nine, it doesn't happen within like a couple of weeks or a few months, and it goes up and down and and intensifies and gets weaker, and that's just part of it. Because I believe the executions really cause some form of grief within mm. a lot of people in Iran, because of course, it, it like someone dying is there is no better or worse how how they die. Yes. You know, someone dying on the street is just as awful and saddening as someone being executed. But the resolution of the regime shows in a different way when you execute someone. Yes. You know, you yes. have to actually do it. You have to get up early in the morning. You have to do all kinds of horrible, like, I, I can't even, I still can't believe that we are executing people in the 21st century. Yes. And it's, so, a, it's a calculated, intentional horrific yeah. barbaric act yeah. and even the way it's done is hearkening to the middle ages exactly yeah i mean they just all the steps that you need to put someone you know on a crane just 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 you know just imagining it so that i think that did put a lot of sadness and grief in a lot of people as for myself like the the two weeks after the executions i was not doing well like I could see, I, like I was way more, like a lot, so sad all the time, just about the fact that they really did that. And so it's just, it comes and goes in phases. That's how it is. It, it can take many months. It can take more than a year, but I do not believe, and I, it's just beyond my imagination how this regime is going to get these people back. And every person they kill, every child that they kill, 
it's going to bring up so much anger and so much more of it's enough. And we have the 40th, you know, the 40th uh, day of death. Every time it's a huge protest. Yeah. We had that with Kion Pierre Falak. We have that, to, we had that today in different cities. And I, you know, you never know, you know, revolutions happen when you don't expect them to happen. Gildas Ahebi, I'm so grateful for the time you've given us. I'm grateful for the work you do. Congratulations again on your recent distinction, your Journalist of the Year Award, and um, I hope you'll come back. Definitely, I would love to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. This dream I'm dreaming Won't you wake me up tonight Cause this life I'm living Doesn't really feel like mine This strange dream Never thought you would leave. I never thought I'd have to start again. Somebody pray. This is Rook, episode 227 The Uprising. Dear Western journalists, your colleagues are behind bars. In Iran. Let's get to our next guest, and he is here in the Rook studio. If you are in or familiar with the Persian community here in Toronto, you will perhaps know of my next guest today. Ebrin Bagheri is a talented Iranian-Canadian visual artist who's well-known for using references from Persian poetry to deconstruct the traditional concept of masculinity and gender norms in his paintings. He's made quite a splash in the art world and counts Queen Farah Pahlavi amongst his fans. Ebrin was born and raised in Iran. He moved to Canada where he received his master's degree in fine arts. In the last four months, Ebrin has been painting portraits of the victims of the regime brutality in Iran and has been using his art for solidarity with Iranians around the diaspora at this momentous time and right now. Ebrin Bakhari joins me in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. Nice to have you back here. Step into the microphone there. Don't be shy. Okay. Uh, yeah. You are. You're, you're not shy. Are you shy? Um, sometimes, sometimes you are shy. Yeah. 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 Um, first of all, I mean, you came from Iran at the age of 19. You've been here. You've never shied away from your Iranianness and and um, some of the feelings and emotions you had about leaving and needing to leave to to live a more free life. Absolutely. Um, what has been the most painful or difficult uh, element for you in witnessing what has been happening in Iran in the last four months? The young lives, the long lives that there are gone, so they're irreplaceable. Um, <clears throat> it's so sad for me. It's like a pain in my heart. Anytime I see, um, anytime I'm on my Instagram or social media or on TV, I see almost every day a young person is dead just because of Iranian regime. They don't like them. They're just fighting for their freedom. This is something that I cannot mm, bear with at and, all. And you cannot look away at the same no, time. No, I absolutely no. So I cannot do anything. Like, you know what I feel? I feel like I'm powerless. I feel like I wish I could do something more. I wish I could go back to Iran and fight with them. But you know what? I don't think I can do anything of this. So what do you <laughs> think you would be? You know, you certainly can't go back to Iran without yeah. getting in some some trouble, based on some of the things you painted. But what 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 do you think you would be doing if you were in Iran? Well, I would be protesting on the street every day, every night, along with them. I'm also Iranian. It just my the location of my living is different. I live in a more free uh, country, so it doesn't mean that I'm not Iranian or I don't feel their pain. So I feel that I, I wish I could go back mm. and fight as much as I could. We've been talking a lot in recent <clears throat> weeks about the 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 contradiction of feelings that we have on the one hand we're we've talked about the sadness of the devastation the kids uh, you think about and, and and the brutality and the deaths on the other hand 
uh, be inspiration of what's been happening in in the last um, four months now almost. Has it been empowering for you on some level to see what is going on in Iran, given the changes you would have wanted there when you were there? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm really, really um, fascinated by the bravery of the young generation that I see. In my generation, when I was living in Iran, people, they, they, they were not as brave as this. So the, the, the government, they were trying to scare people of doing anything political. Mm. So of course, people were fighting. Of course, people, they were all prisons, were full of political prisoners but in young generation the age of 16 14 15 they're fighting for freedom i wonder if <clears throat> if they they just gave up or maybe they just had nothing to lose you know what they're not scared of them anymore mm. so it's very inspiring for me and also i'm so proud to see the new generation they're just not backing up to just uh, continue fighting. I've seen you uh, personally on the the protests here in in Toronto. We've uh, we've seen each other, um, but you haven't ju- just been uh, attending protests. You've you've really kind of shape shifted in terms of what you do as an artist. I mean, you've been, I would say, of of the artists of the works that I know, uh, you stand out as someone who's quite famously consistent as an artist uh and part of the consistency is creating variations of your own image in in your paintings and drawings we have a couple of them here in the rook uh, um foyer that is until now uh tell me when you first had the inspiration to start drawing the figures of those who um as i say the victims of the regime in, in iran and how big a step that was for you artistically given that consistency that i i talked about you know what my imme- you know what my immediate reaction was just naturally went through my pain so i i paint and draw uh, my feelings so when i when i saw what's going on in iran i could not do anything else except just focusing on on what's going on in iran i have uh, 12 students so all my 12 students suspended my classes. I could not do You can't anything. teach. No, I can't teach. Why not? I cannot do anything else besides focusing on the portraits as I'm doing of these heroes, basically. So, And I'm assuming you don't do commission work. No, now. I'm not. I'm not. So I'll, if somebody says, "I'm," uh, let me give you a million dollars to paint. Uh, the, no, no, no. Well, a million dollar maybe, <laughs> but in a few <laughs> months. Say, all right. But no, but uh, to be honest. But really, I, I mean, if somebody asks you to do something right now, you're just not in the headspace. Well, no, no. I'm doing, um, I'm giving myself a, a space to do my artwork after whatever, after I feel more comfortable doing it. Right now, I'm not feeling comfortable making money right now, just, you know, painting and changing my mood about mm. what's going on in Iran. So I cannot. So it's such a it's such a tough one. You know, I when we talk about people, artists, people, uh, um, I'm in the same position as somebody who's doing this kind of a programming and, and, and in media and arts, etc. that um we necessarily shift what we're doing in a way that I don't necessarily see an engineer or a real estate agent Absolutely. not to take anything away from oh, them. Yeah. And there are certainly, you know, engineers and real estate agents I've seen on the protests as well. But but they're not saying I'm now focusing all my engineering on yeah. I- Iran. Yeah. But um, you feel that imperative. You uh, you can't I you can't feel- actually do business right now. Yeah. I, I, I you know what I feel I'm paralyzed. I feel that I am only able to answer my feelings and, um, and my emotions. Um, and that's the only thing I can do. That transition wasn't difficult for me. Mm. It just came very naturally. It wasn't really tough decision for me to, you know, instead of, don't get me wrong. So the commission work and the, the exhibition, whatever it has, the, 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 whatever in the future I have. It's your living. It's yeah, your, yeah, it's my living. I'm, I'm going to do it. But in, in a way, I suspended my work. So maybe in, uh, in two months, three months, I'm not going to work on their commission work at the moment. But 
I think it's more important for me that focus on what's going on in Iran and be their voices mm. rather to just focusing on my business as a you know art I'm not saying art is a business but arts also I'm making money to live right um, so that's why I'm trying to for I'm trying to um, draw attentions of the, the the heroes that they, they lost their lives. Yeah. I'm doing their yeah. portraits. Kiani Pirfalag was only nine years old. Yeah, he did not deserve to die. Who was the first of the the young people in Iran that you decided you wanted to draw or paint? I started with uh, Mahsa Amini. I started with Mahsa Amini, and it was a quite emotional process for me. Like I, a different process from the way very, it normally very is. Very different process. It, it was completely different. How so? Normally, I'm really, um, I know what I'm doing. It's, it's confident. I just go, do not a sketch or whatever. I'm comfortable in a drawing and painting area. But if, for me, when I was staring at her eyes, I so just wanted to capture her eyes and her emotion. I could not stop crying. She was full of life. She did not deserve to die at the age of 22 in her own motherland, in her own country, just because of selfishness of the government right mm. uh, I started with Masa Amini and then continue so far uh, I don't think I'm missing anyone but I have done every single um, every single person that have been uh, publicized and we know of, of of course there are a lot of people that have lost their lives but we don't know yet because of the pressure the government or the regime are pressure giving to their families they're not they're not letting them to yeah. talk. Yeah. How do you d how do you just uh, decide who you're going to do next, and how long do each of these portraits take you? Um, I I just you know what look at them. If a few of them actually I repeated, I repeated like for Serena and mm -hmm. uh, Nika, and um, <clears throat> what was it? Nika Serena. I did maybe two or three portraits of, of them. So it's also a process that it makes me relax and calm because I have I also have to take care of my mental health, um, which is very important for us. You know what, if yeah. we just really caught up with this situation that it's, it's really draining. So we have to do something to keep up with our mental health, yeah. which I think regime targeted our mental health, right? So to me, I never experienced the amount of <coughs> rage and anger and hate in me. I never had that much hate in my life. How can I? You feel angry. I feel angry. I'm so mad at them. I'm so angry. I hate them. Weren't you but angry before? I was. You I know mean, what? you had to. You basically left Iran I, yeah, because it would. I was, but to be, to be honest with you, um, the Ukrainian airplane crash yeah, yeah. was the the beginning of the time, the period of time for me that I felt, oh my god, you know what? I have to take care of my mental health because they're targeting me. Yeah. I cannot live with yeah. hate every second. Anytime I walk, I was full of hate and anger. But before that, it was personal. Right now, it's more than personal. It's like a people. Just you know what I mean? I cannot just think of myself. Mm. I think of like all the Iranians. They're living in a really, really sad situation. It feels like it's very surreal. Mm. Like imagine if we, we are... <coughs> living in a free country and we're watching them imagine if they are living in the the inside of that hell yeah, yeah. it's so difficult for them one of the things i love about these portraits that you're you're doing um people like you people like nakba ja who's also doing portraits it's your version of be her be, be our voice it's your version of say her name you're doing it visually Absolutely. and <clears throat> Something that's quite amazing about that is we've just had um, Gilda Gilda Sahibi on. Uh, she was in, in, in Germany. I don't know if you, you were listening along with She was the guest right before you. But she was saying that, you know, this 
there were there were always people dissenting in Iran. What one of the things that's changed, and one of the things that's been quite golden about this time, is we we know these people, and we we know their names and we know who they are especially the kids <clears throat> yeah. right it's by one name for Iranians around the world you can say you just said Nikon Sarina we know exactly who you're talking about exactly and so you're painting you're drawing these images of people that um, it's almost inconceivable before this time that some kid that this is not Michael Jackson or oh, yeah. Donald Trump that you know the world knows as some iconic figure and yet the whole community knows who you are drawing. Right? Exactly. The, the, one of the um, moments that I felt really down <sighs> about the portraits that I was doing, it was Khoda Noor. Mm. I know Khoda I live in Toronto. People everywhere in the world, they know Khoda Noor now, now. But Khoda Noor had no birth certificate. Yeah. The Iranian government, they didn't give her, give him Shanas Khoda Nur is from uh, Zahedan. Zahedan, yeah, yeah. Right? He didn't have any birth certificate, any ID. Like, Iranian government, they did not even recognize him as a person. So, it was so sad for me. Even though he didn't have birth certificate, but obviously it was recognized by the whole entire board. What's been, um, you, you, you said that uh, I noticed on a, a number of these, you have chosen to call, for example, Majid Reza, who was Man. executed. Um, you call them heroes. Tell me about seeing these people as heroes. You know what? The fact they fought until the last moment, they could they could just go on the TV and say whatever this, the old scenario that the Iranian government makes for everybody. They just say, you know what, we, we regret, we did forced this. Forced confessions. Yeah, yeah, forced confession, whatever. So they maybe they did that, but uh, they, they stood by their belief until the end of it, mm. right? They could get out of this, but they did not. They fought until the last moment. To me, they're heroes, of course. And one of the sad... Um, sad images that I saw recently was Majid Reza's before execution his left arm was broken yeah. and a picture of her another picture was circling on the internet he had a oh, tattoo he had a tattoo of Ex she of course she yeah and it was so sad for me that you know how they well, broke his arm because because of that the sun and lion you know which represents yeah. um so there are a lot of heroes like Fatima Sepehri, like he, she is in Iran and she is in prison, but she fought in Iran against Khamenei while living in Iran. So how? Well, she is a hero. Too much is a hero. So these people are very insp inspirational for, not for me, but for a lot of people. What is the Heroes book series? It's actually a sketchbook of the people that from um, this period of time since September until now, they have either they lost their lives or they are fighting for their freedom or for people's freedom in the, in the prison. So it's, um, it's a series of the number of portraits. Mm. And is it going to be, are you going to print it? Is it going to be available you know somehow? What? We're thinking of um, showing this this series of the work. Yeah, maybe at Art Gallery. Mm, very nice. I I mentioned that um, one of your fans is Queen Farah, who you've you've done a portrait of. And, and uh, I think you gave it to her or she commissioned yeah, it or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, have you spoken to her in the last three or four months? Uh, I did. We, we talked um, a few days ago. Yeah. What did she say? She, um, you know what? On I was in Paris actually. I, I met her in Paris on Aval Mehma. Uh, it was the very beginning of the protest. So when I when I was in her house, we saw each other. We say, "Oh my God, how brave they are!" Yeah. So we both were shocked at how brave and strong these teenagers basically they are in Iran. Yeah. She's very optimistic, Her Majesty. Um, it's it's amazing. <clears throat> you you, saw, you spoke to her a few days ago. I, I spoke to her a few days ago, like and, last week maybe. And you, and she feels optimistic. 
Um, we didn't we didn't talk about this. Yeah. Do you feel optimistic? I feel optimistic. I feel finally Pirus Chaim Shot. Hamamun Pirus Chaim Shot. Shahbanu Farah has a, um, a signature word that he signs. Nur bar tariki Pirus Chahat Shot. Translate oh. that for us. Yeah. So the light will victory the darkness. Yes. Which is we'll amazing. the darkness. Yeah. Yes. Do you have a sense of how how you're going to get back to doing your regular work, or are you happy to be doing what you're not happy, but are you um, fulfilled to be doing what you're doing right now in terms of the the revolution? You know what? I wanted to mention something. Honare eterazi or protest art. It's something that I have never seen anywhere in the world or in, in, in art history that amount of artists or even non-professional artists, performance art, literature, visual art, drawing, it's really painting, exploded. every yeah. day yeah. you see the huge amount of artwork produced against the regime yes. in support of people, yes. which is wonderful. I'm, I'm not sure when I will move out from my mood maybe after the victory mm. but so far um, my focus is only in um, be their voice and every what kind of reaction is there any particular reaction that you want to share that stuck with you or moved you in terms of people reacting to the work you've done um, I had um, I had I received a few messages from a few member of I'm not going to say the name, maybe there will be a problem mm -hmm. with them because they are in Iran. A few of the uh, people... Uh, the family members? The family the members oh, or wow. relatives, yeah. That I am trying to somehow give their portraits to them, um, which is amazing that yeah. they they felt very happy that you know I was their, their, their voice. Mm -hmm. So, which How is, did it feel to hear from them? Um, I cried. <laughs> I cried. I could not stop crying. It just was, it was a very emotional moment for me because I was not trying to reach their family or show them that I did the portrait. They contacted me and they were interested in the portraits I did. They, they thanked me. I mm. should thank them, but they thanked me. Well, let me thank you as well. <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's you. always good to see you. We, um, I always like want to have you on the show to talk thank about you. your your tremendous work. But this um, this moment where you're doing these portraits, uh, they they move me as well, and I'm a big fan of yours. Thank and you. I, I thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the wonderful work you do and the interviews and everything for the community, which is I think. At this moment, we all have to ha have each other's back and support. This is the only thing we can do. Merci, Ebrin. Uh, that's Ebrin Bagheri. Um, check him out on his social media. Check out his his um, tremendously moving uh, portraits of uh, the victims of the um, the current regime during this um, this revolution during this uprising. And uh, let me see if I can. Find I just my wanted to mention something. Yes. Zan Zendigi Azadi. Thank you, Everett. Um, this is full time for Rook for today. Thank you to the amazing team who put this show together. Uh, Savi Roham, Anahita, Parisa, Pega, Merhdad, and Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us, sharing our content. Please subscribe on any of our platforms if you haven't done so already. Remember, our, our main hub is rookmedia.com, where you can link to all of our videos and, and commentary and uh, clips and all of the episodes from this uprising series. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi Mizunbashin. <laughs>